Yes. 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 Beautiful. Beautiful. What is what is the definition of ihsan? Excellence. Excellent. Excellence, yes. Much effort. Well, first, there has to be tawakkul. What is tawakkul? Depending on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, always, right? First and foremost. And then you do your part, right? هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ Right? If you put in effort after, of course, your tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you do the best that you can, it will come back. It will. You may not know when because the timing is on Allah's time. Allah knows when you will see the fruits of your labor in your children. You don't know when. Okay? But Allah promised us, هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ Okay? So, what I want to start off by asking you is, is this, the, the topic is very interesting the way you, you worded it, right? How to build resilience. That word just made my head like go in all sorts of places yesterday, right? What does build imply? No, no right or wrong answer. Just talk to me. Yes. Mm. Very good. Like a progression. Okay. What else? What, what else does it imply? You start from nothing. Okay. What else? Building a base. Yes. That's okay. Okay. Anything else? Modeling. Rosada, when did you get in here? <laughs> okay. Foundation. Okay. So, okay. Beautiful. All of it. Great. Okay. For me, I've been a psychologist, alhamdulillah, over 20 years. So I can't help where my brain goes sometimes. I can't turn it off sometimes. When I looked at the word build, to me, it implied possibility. Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullah. It implied possibility. Right? possibility. It's not like your kid has it or doesn't. It's not like your kid is born with it genetically or not. Right? Because if it's, wa salam wa rahmatullah, if it's a done deal, if it's a done deal, right? How can you build? Okay? So build to me insinuates hope and it insinuates possibility. Agreed? Okay. How many times have we seen children, my, my husband is here, he's the athletic director of the school. How many times have we seen children in the sports program who, who are not born athletes, but subhanAllah with the, the, the encouragement of the school, the coaches, right? The administration, the parents after, of course, first and foremost, um, help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and guidance from Allah, they become amazing athletes, okay? You're not born with resilience, okay? Resilience is built. It is made, okay? Let's talk a little bit about um, a few things, inshallah, in our deen, in our religion, okay, that help support the idea. First of all, if there's, if you're born with it, okay, you're either strong or not strong, okay, you're resilient or not resilient, okay, it wouldn't make sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be giving us all these instructions in the Quran, right? 
in the specific verses of the Quran that, that tell us specific things or instruct us or guide us. I'm gonna give you a few examples and I want you all to participate and come up with your own, okay? For example, does it not say, Fasbir sabran jamila? Okay, Brother Mamduh, can you help me with the translation? Fasbir sabran jamila. Yes. Yes. So, so be patient with beautiful patience, right? If humans are born resilient or not, okay, it why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put so much, you know, in the Quran with beautiful wording, okay, with strong words and instructions, do it this way. Okay, because he knows that the human subhanAllah is not perfect, right? So he gave us words of wisdom. Another example. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, sta'inu bi sabri wa salah, inna allaha ma'a sabri. Okay, who can help me translate this one? Yes. Yes, yes. Seek the help through salah, through patience, right? Aren't, think about this. Think about the wisdom. Isn't this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us how to cope, how to be resilient? Okay. Pay attention. Pay attention to what you're learning about your deen. It's all right there. Okay. Any other examples that you can think of? Any ahadith or ayahs that you can think of? Yes, Iman. Yes. Yes. Yes, that, that is a very good example because doesn't it imply that resilience has a lot to do with support relationships? Can't do it by yourself, can you? Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do it by himself. The way Allah created us is we need each other to learn resilience. Okay, and of course, we'll talk a little bit more about how that applies to parents. Okay, any other examples? Right? Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if they ask you about me, I am close. What does he advise us to do? Right? Come to me. Okay, believe in me ask me, I am close, okay? It's implying again that in your relationship with me, right? In your relationship with me, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? You can find strength, you can find resilience, okay? All right, let's talk a little bit about the definition of resilience. How do you understand it? Yes, yes, please. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's a very good, great example. Yes, translation. Be patient. Yes. Okay, thank you. Perfect example, and it actually helps me transition to <laughs> to, to my next topic. So resilience, what does it mean? 
to you. Absolutely. Yes, ability to overcome. Okay, what else? Stability, flexibility. Okay, yes, very good. Okay, yes. Yep. Yes, that's it. Very good. Alhamdulillah. Okay. I need you to understand something, not just from a psychological perspective, but from an Islamic perspective. Resilience is not in action. Hayat, can you help me with that one? What, do you, what, what does that mean to you? It is not in action or being passive. Mm -hmm. Yep. Which is an action in and of itself. Correct? Okay. So resilience is action oriented, right? It's action oriented. Correct? Let's take it. Yes. To bounce back. Right. 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 But that's that's an action. Correct? That is an in and of itself a reaction, an action. Correct? Let's how think about think about making toba. Okay? Think about it. What does it involve? Mm-hmm. You're seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Okay. Yes. Correct. Okay. Look at your deen. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a'udhu billah, does he, we make mistakes, does he say, forget it, you're done? He's always forgiving. He says the doors are always open. I'm giving you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the resources, and then what? It's up to us to use the resources because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us free will, right? He knows what we're going to choose, but we choose, we make the choices, correct? Okay, so... Tell yourself, remind yourself, forget psychology for now. As a Muslim, as a mu'min, resilience is action. The Muslim, the mu'min is not passive. Okay? Subhanallah. If you have stories, let me know. But how many times do I hear this misconception from a brother or sister, from a parent, who says, I'm... I'm you know, that there, there's an injustice, there's an oppression of some sorts, whether at school, in the marriage, at home, at, at their work, okay? They say, I'm, I'm being patient. Okay, great, what are you doing? I'm, I'm being patient, okay? Passive patience in suffering is not what Islam is about. Yes, you are patient as you waiting for Allah's decree, and meanwhile, you act. Muslim, the mu'min, is not passive. Okay? That is not really the accurate definition of patience and resilience. Okay? What is resilience not? Okay? It is not taking undue risk and being careless. As an example, as a parent, you're not going to take your four-year-old son to the edge of the street and say, cross the street, dodge the cars, be strong, okay? Resilience isn't carelessness. It's not recklessness, okay? It's not that. It is not that. It is not pushing your child to a breaking point. That is abuse. That is not building resilience. Look at all of the stories of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
and how he used to treat children. Where in there did he advise us to break the child? That is not resilience, okay? Two stories. All of you know Dr. Sarat likes to tell stories, right? I have, I, I know of a mother, subhanAllah, she had good intention, okay? Every time her son, he was going through, um, through his teenage years, adolescence, and every time, you know, he would go through a hard time, okay? She would have him sit down and with her read Surah Yasin. Beautiful. That Surah, mashallah, is very soothing and very comforting, okay? But even though, subhanAllah, her intention was good, the result didn't match the intention. At some point, he would say, Mama, I'm tired. Can I go to sleep? Well, Mama, not today. Today, I just, I have a lot of stress. I just want to be. But she would insist. Insist. Okay? You know what happened? He grew up and he left Islam. He became an atheist. Islam building resilience in children isn't about pushing them to their breaking point. That's not what resilience, how to build resilience as a Muslim parent is about, okay? It is not about, it is not about having no emotion. It's not about raising children who don't cry. And that includes boys, by the way. Okay? Tell me stories of the Prophet وسلم, that contradict being emotionless. What happened when his beloved wife Khadija died? What happened? What happened? Am? Am al Huzun. He went through a period of time. What does Huzun mean? Sadness. This is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who went through grief and depression and sadness, right? He's the most perfect of all human beings, right? So don't tell me as a Muslim parent, one of your ways of getting children to be strong is to teach them not to feel. Allah gave us a heart for a reason. Without the heart, there is no empathy. There is no compassion, okay? It is not teaching your child not to cry. It's teaching them how to feel and how to overcome. What we say in psychology, if you can't feel it, you can't heal it. It's actually the opposite. If you tell your children to put their emotions away, okay, it's actually going to create the opposite of building resilience. Let's talk about the psyche of the human being, okay? Let's say right now somebody does something to me and I'm really, really, really angry, okay? That anger is going to cloud my judgment. It's going to cloud my ability to overcome, correct? In order for someone to move on, don't they have to have their brain online? Don't they have to problem solve and use logic and use thinking? Well, Allah created us in his wisdom in a way that if you're being flooded by emotions, your brain is offline. Go back to the way that the Prophet ﷺ taught us to live. What did he say about anger? Yes. 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 Okay. Right. Correct. Okay. So did he, does that imply pretend the anger isn't there? Right, feel it, but notice that 
that is not implying don't feel the emotion. It's implying what you do with it. Do you see the difference? In order to teach our children resilience, we have to allow them to feel what they feel. But the issue is not to leave them stuck in that feeling, to help them figure out how to move on, okay? So resilience is not about telling your kids not to feel, okay? Resilience as a parent, teaching your children to be resilient is not just about nurturing a child. It's also about disciplining the child, right? In the Quran, there are many verses that nurture our souls, correct? But doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran also discuss hudud and boundaries? Look, your, your religion is telling you nurture and discipline. Allah doesn't say, you know, you all do whatever you want, you know, more power to you, okay? If our creator who knows us, who knows what we need, who knows our best interest is telling us nurture and structure, nurture and discipline, right? I, I would think we would follow that same path with our children. Look, in psychology, there is a common understanding. Extremes cause the same result. Children who are not disciplined, i.e. spoiled, and children on the opposite extreme who are only disciplined and not nurtured, i.e. neglected or abused, do you know, subhanAllah, the end result of both extremes is the same? We, we tell ourselves a lie. If we just love, 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 love the kid, they're going to be fine. No, they're not. They're going to grow up to be narcissists. They're going to grow up believing that they are above the rules and the law. They're going to come into your school and challenge you, right? And say, uh, I don't have to do that. Okay. My mother, subhanAllah, always used to say, Al-ta'allum fi sigar kal naqshi al-hajar. Okay? That's my mother, subhanAllah. She sometimes, she's, she's a woman of few words, but when she says something, it like sticks. Right? Can, can you explain what that means? Teach it children as, as early as you know? Yeah. It's like uh, carbon and in a rock. It stays with you. Okay. You all know the way you're raising your kids is how they're going to treat their spouses, how they're going to raise their own children. You know that, right? Right? So the idea in mind is how do we raise our children so that the world doesn't suffer? Right? My brain, especially with my boys, Harith and Abdurrahman, I'm always thinking, how do I raise them so when they get married one day, inshallah, they're not a burden onto their wives? Thinking ahead, right? Because if you don't teach them this lesson, they are going to be a burden onto other people, correct? And then somebody else is going to have to teach them that lesson whether it's a police officer, a teacher, a wife, somebody else is gonna teach them that lesson. And guess what? That other person doesn't have the rahmah and the mercy that you have for them. So you better teach it to them. Understood? Okay. So um, when we look also at exa examples in the Quran, can you think of any surah in the Quran that to you really embodies the idea of resilience? For me, because we're running out of time, I'm going to start going a little bit faster, inshallah. Surah Taha. Okay? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to Prophet Musa, alayhi salam, and he's telling him to go confront Fir'aun, right? Because he's transgressed. 
What does Prophet Musa alayhi salam say? Qala rabbana innana nakhafu an yafrut alayna aw an yatta. Okay? Basically, ya Allah, we're scared. He was talking about him and his brother. We're scared that if we come confront this arrogant Pharaoh, that he is going to harm us. Okay? What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Muhammad, you, you love Surah Taha. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell him right after that? Yeah, he said, لا تخافا إنني معكما أسمع وأرى He said, don't be scared. Allah is telling him, don't be scared. I'm with you. I hear and I see. Did Allah tell him, abandon the mission? This is too hard, too scary. Abandon the mission. No, Allah said, push, push, okay, push forward. Notice though, Prophet Musa alayhi salam said, I'm, a, I'm scared. Notice he had feelings too, okay? What did Allah say? He said, don't, don't be afraid, I'm with you. Again, what is it saying? You push, you can do this. I am with you. Relationship, I am with you, okay? All right, let's talk about, inshallah, the fears of parents. What fears do you all have as parents about pushing your kids just a little bit? What fears do you have? Clearly, you're here because you're afraid of something or you don't know how to do something or something. Okay, so what fears do you have? What are you afraid of? Okay, okay. Okay, great. What fears do you have about pushing them, about disciplining them? What fears do you have? Breaking point, okay, what else? Resentment, okay, let me tell you something, the way it plays out in reality, okay? You don't discipline your kid in the moment, they're gonna love you to death, okay? One day, one day, somebody is gonna discipline them. They're going to turn around and say, it was your fault. It was your fault. My line of thinking is every parent has to do their job. You're either going to do it when they're young or you're going to do it when they're an adult. I personally choose, have chosen to do my job when my kids are younger so that inshallah, when, when they're older, I can sit back and rest. Okay. You can't get away from doing your time. You want to do it when they're younger or you want to do it when they're older? Pick. Okay. It, it's going to be harder. It's going to be harder. Correct. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about um, how. In terms. Sure. Well, when it, it depends on the age. So. Notice that the more independence that they have, the less control now you're going to have over them, okay? And then you're going to have to take more extreme measures, as an example, okay? If your kid is being disrespectful to you, okay, when they're four or five, okay? There's a, there's a way you can handle it, right? Okay, but let's say they are 30 years old and they're living in their own home and now they're disrespecting you. The, the response is going to have to be more extreme, as in, don't call me anymore, right? You can't, like, send them to time out, right? The response is going to be more extreme. Don't call me anymore. Don't enter my house anymore, right? So what I'm trying to say is you're going to eventually have to do it. Why don't you do it when they're younger and they're still, their brain is still like Play-Doh, and they're still under the authority of your home. Isn't that, doesn't that make sense? Okay, so what I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about inshallah is how to build resilience, okay? I want you to, Brother Mamdou, we have 10 minutes, right? Okay, remember and, E-N-D. Okay, what does end stand for? E stands for expose. N is for nurture. 
And D is for discipline. Okay. This is how you build resilience. Okay. You expose them to it. Okay. You expose them to an appropriate level of frustration. Okay. You don't say, oh, cross the street. There's a billion cars. That's not appropriate levels of frustration. Okay. But let's say they disrespected their teacher at school. They come home. Okay. You don't go against the teacher. Why? Because you're teaching the kid that all they have to do is come home and mama will take care of everything. Great. When they're married and they're disrespecting their spouse and their spouse is angry and upset, you're going to go and take care of things? No, you're not. Okay. You don't go against the teacher. You're teaching the child that they are above other people's rights. You're teaching the child that there's no authority to respect. It's all about them and what they want. Now, I'm not talking about extremes where there is zulum or oppression. If the child is being oppressed, really? Yes, then you go and have a discussion with the teacher, but we're not talking about those extremes. We're talking about if the kid misbehaved and the teacher gave him a, a change in color, okay? You're not gonna go against the teacher. You can empathize. You can say, I'm sorry that happened to you. That's pretty serious. It must be hard to be suspended. You can empathize, right? But then your next step is to, what do we do next time? And how do we figure our way out of this? Correct? So you expose. You don't overprotect them. You don't overprotect them. Because one day you're not going to be with them. And if they're 100% dependent on you, what are they going to do when you're not there? Okay? You expose them to it, but you don't abandon them during the exposure. You give them what they need. Can you all remember the word need? Not want. Need. If they need nurture, you nurture. If they need discipline, you discipline. You give the child healthy parenting is when you give them what they need, not what they want, okay? Maybe they want to be spoiled, but maybe they need discipline. You then discipline, okay? This is not a popularity context. You're not trying to, you know, trying to be popular, okay? This is not a popularity contest here. You're trying to be an effective parent in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you see Allah one day, inshallah, you're going to say, I did the best that I can. Okay, so expose, nurture, discipline. These two go hand in hand. You can't do one without the other. You need both. Islam is about balance. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes, okay. I'm going to tell you a few more things and then we'll be done, inshallah, for today. Okay, sometimes... One of the fears that parents have is I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want to cause them pain. Okay, think about what you're saying. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created pain. So we know when something is good. Because if everything is always good and there is no pain, then how do you know when something is good? Out of pain, inshallah, something good will come out of it. Question. When someone has broken their leg, okay, hadith, playing basketball, did something to his knee one time, okay, had to go to the physical therapist, and I was there watching hadith, and the physical therapist is moving his legs, and hadith is like turning purple from the pain, okay? What happened after a few sessions? He started walking again and he started running and dunking again. Out of pain comes something good. Okay. For me, painful 14 years after high school. Painful studies, 14 years after high school. 
okay? Painful. Let me, let's just keep it at that, okay? But out of it, what came? Knowledge, the ability to effectively heal, of course, with, with the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I'm here with you, and you're learning something from me. If you have a counterpart of mine, okay, who cheated her way through school, teachers always gave her the answers. Would you go to her or would you come to me? You'd come to me because I did my time. Out of pain comes good. Yes, out of pain comes good. Don't be afraid, okay? Sure, sure. Correct. Yes. You want to be the one to influence. Even if they're young, not four years old, but sure. sometimes think nine years old. Oh no, they don't understand these things that if you and they are teenagers we'll talk about it. Well, they hear it and they see it on the internet and they see it all the time. Right. That fear could be taken out. Even that they can understand. It. Sure. And in addition to that, what you're talking about is exposure. Okay but it has to be age appropriate. So you're not gonna talk to a nine or 10 year old boy in the same way about gender interactions as you would with a 16 year old boy, correct? It has to be age appropriate, but you're absolutely right. Expose and then age appropriate. Okay, yes, sure. Mm -hmm. This is the age we should be discussing with the future child. Like this is the age that we should be talking to them. Can sure. Do you have any guidance on that? Maybe afterwards. Or yeah, sure. Afterwards, you're more than welcome to come and ask me if you have specific questions. But listen, you don't have to worry about it because life will do it. They're going to be exposed to some kind of frustration at school with a, with a parent, with a friend, with a teacher, with some test, with some subject, right? with so something. So life is already gonna hand it to you, right? You don't have to worry about that. So life will, will give them those opportunities. Our job is to prepare them for those opportunities, okay? What you need, so I've told you what parent, parents have to do with their children, okay? What do parents need? Parents need patience, right? Parents need patience, correct? You have to be able to regulate your own anxiety and your own emotions as you are teaching your child resilience, right? When, when you tell your kid, go to your room for five minutes and think about how you've just talked to me, okay? And the kid starts to fuss, okay? That's it. Are you going to be patient and deliver? Or are you going to buckle under your own emotions and give the child what they want, not what they need? So in order to raise resilient children, you have to be resilient. You have to be patient. You have to stand there and control your emotions as they're crying and breaking down. This is how you're building strength. This is how you're teaching them to strengthen their skin, right? But it requires you to control your feelings because if you jump in too quickly, what happens? Lesson not learned, right? They have to feel the pain. Pain creates change. 
Nobody likes to live in pain. Okay? So you have to learn how to work on your own patience, inshallah. The other piece as a parent, one more thing. You need patience and you need self-care. If you're tired, if you're not sleeping well, if you're not eating well, okay, then when it comes to having patience and seeing the child through, what's going to happen? You're going to burst because you're tired. You need resilience. You need to have had your cup of coffee, right? So you can go to war and you can win. Understood? Okay. Inshallah. Do I, do I have time? Okay. I have, inshallah, one more, um, uh, one more story I want to share with you. And then we'll talk about number six, inshallah. So let me tell you a, a little story about myself. So I grew up in Illinois. And at that time, there was no Islamic school that was around, okay? So I had to, you know, go to public school. SubhanAllah, when I was 10, my parents took me to an ISNA conference back in the day when there were ISNA conferences, right? And, you know, in the ISNA conferences, they, they, they encourage the girls, right, to wear hijab just to practice, Okay, so I came home at the age of 10 and I told, I made an announcement. I told my parents, I'm not taking off my hijab. I'm keeping it on. My parents said, alhamdulillah, but be sure because it's not a game. You're going to keep it on. Okay, if you're not sure, take your time. I said, no, I'm not taking it off. Alhamdulillah, I haven't taken off my hijab since 10 years old. Alhamdulillah. But it caused a lot of difficulties for me, imagine, when I was in public school. Even though there were a lot of Muslim girls with me, none of them wore hijab. So they could kind of blend in, okay? So there was one time, sixth grade, I remember it very clearly, where a Russian federation was coming to talk about human rights to the school, okay? So being being myself, every day at 3.30 exactly, I would be standing outside of my school and my dad would come driving in his station wagon. Remember the days of the station wagons? On the dot, he would come. And on the way, on the ride home, it would be my therapy session. Oh, well, this person said this to me, this teacher, da, 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 da. right? And my dad would listen. And sometimes if I was really having a hard time, he would take me to Dairy Queen. That's when my Dairy Queen addiction started. <laughs> but even though, subhanAllah, I was the only girl, I have three brothers, he would always sit down with me and he would say, you can handle this. He would always say, Baba, you are up to the task. <laughs> this is what he would always tell me. Even though you're a girl, you're strong. You can do this. So I told him, Baba, this Russian Federation is coming over. Okay. I want to ask a question. He's like, okay, what question would you like to ask? So the Russian Federation came and the whole school, hundreds of people and the principal and whomever were in the gym. They finished their, their talk, questions. I raised my hand, stood up in front of the entire school. So I said, I have a question, respectfully. Yes, what is your question? You're here talking to us about human rights. Yes, we were proponents of human rights. I said, so explain to me what you're doing to the Afghani people. This was at the time of the Afghani um, war with Russia. I said, what are you doing to the women and the children? And I stood and I refused to sit down. Sixth grade. Okay. So then the Russian Federation, they say, that's a good question. Give us a minute. They go into a huddle seriously with the principal and I'm still standing. Okay. And you feel like the, the walls are melting, the tension. <laughs> okay. And I stood. So then the guy comes out and he says, thank you for your question. It's a really good question. Mm -hmm. I said, yes. He said, we don't have an answer for that. 
I said, okay, thank you. And I sat down. I couldn't wait till 3.30. <laughs> Baba came. Baba, you know, I asked him my question. He's like, wow, how did it go? Right? He didn't say, don't do that. You're going to embarrass yourself. You're going to get yourself in trouble. He told me how to push, but with decorum. One more. Then that prepared me for what happened to me in junior high. In junior high, there was a boy, Charlie. I'll never forget Charles. <laughs> I was the only girl in the school wearing a hijab. Okay. One time I was going up the stairs. He was going down. He made a fist and he hit me on the top of my head. Okay. Keep moving, Isra. Keep moving. Kept moving. Right? Then, huh? What? Well, listen to my story. Okay. So talk to Baba about that. You're a girl. You're strong. Take care of it. Okay? Take care of it. You get in trouble at school. You're not going to get in trouble at home. You're defending yourself. Okay? Don't oppress, but don't be oppressed. Okay? Fine. Moving on. Back in the day when we had lockers, you all remember the lockers in junior high school? Okay. So there was a gang of five boys. I still remember them. Okay. And these five boys, every single day when the bell would ring at 3 p.m., they would walk through the hallway. Okay. And they would go right, left, and they would push people against their lockers. Okay, just push people against their lockers. Imagine the scene. People were falling like flies. They were, we were just dropped. Okay. So one time, subhanAllah, they, this gang of five boys, they walked through the hallway. They walked through the hallway. Okay. And I still remember my friend on my left, they pushed her. She hit her head on the locker and she dropped. Okay. The leader with the four behind him came to me. He looked at me. He pushed me, hit my head on the locker, and I fell. But that day, I stood up. I looked at him in the eye like this, and I said, why did you do that? And he just smirked. And all I remember is taking my hands and with all my force, I pushed him. He, I still remember him doing this. He flew and hit his head on the vice principal's door and dropped. And then I was like, oh, my God, in my head. Oh, my God. Isra, what did you just do? Oh, boy. Ya Allah, he's coming at you now. But then I told myself, I'm going to fight. If I have to bite him, I'm going to bite him. I'm not going to let him take me down. Right? I kept remembering my dad's words. You're a girl, you're strong. Okay? So he came at me, and even though I was trembling on the inside, I remembered, you know, the sanctity of my hijab. I remembered that I am a Muslim girl. I remembered the love of my father. Okay? I locked eyes with him, and I was prepared. Wallahi, I was prepared to put up a fight. I think he saw that in my eyes. He looked at me and he walked away. And his friends started yelling at him, whoa, she did that to you? He walked away and he never, ever, ever walked in that hallway again. 3.30, Baba, guess what I did? <laughs> yes, Baba, you're up to the task, right? You got this, okay? now. Had it been to an extreme where my dad didn't believe that I could handle it, of course he would have taken action. Of course he would have gone to the school and handled it, right? But that's not the point. The point is he saw me handling it and he taught me how to handle it. And I knew when I would go home, all the stress would go away as soon as that station wagon drove by, right? And well, you know, 
that that Charlie never did it again, and that boy never ever did it again. Okay, so the thing that I need you to understand, and we'll end inshallah with this point. Okay, is that there was a study done, and I'm sure if you you know you've come to my sessions before, I've talked to you about the study of resilience. They asked the question, you can have two children, right, experiencing the same trauma, but one child, subhanAllah, gets PTSD, and the other child is fine. So they asked the question, how come? And the only factor that they found is the child who was able to overcome had a close attachment to a caregiver, subhanAllah. And they said the caregiver is primarily a parent, but it could also be a priest or an imam or a teacher, okay? Or a coach, that's it, right? Or a friend, right? So first and foremost, for us as Muslims, that close emotional attachment, first and foremost to Allah. And then with each other right? That's the only factor. If you do these things properly, and inshallah, if I'm invited in the future to do another Serbia session, I can go into more specifics. But if you are that source of nurture and attachment to your child, you are only, of course, after the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are the only factor that differentiates, do they get traumatized or do they build resilience? So you know what? This is an amana and a weight on you now, okay? Last thing is that number six, all of you are here today because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired you to be here, right? Allah wanted you to be here. So don't take the, the, the knowledge, okay? And not execute it because right now, Right now, I'm giving you now the knowledge. In front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one day, you will be held accountable for this knowledge. Okay? Renew your intention. Tell yourself, inshallah, when I go home, don't say tomorrow, don't say next week, it may not come. Today, based on this knowledge, inshallah, I'm going to go home and practice to the best of my ability, asking for Allah's help to raise more resilient children. Okay? All right. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Dr. Isra, can you give me a May Allah bless you and reward you for your time. Zakalakh to all the parents that came out. Zakalakh to Brother Mamdouf facilitating this. And we'll definitely, inshallah, be having you back. Again soon, inshallah. So let's just end with the du'a. Subhanakallah. Wa bihamdhi. The shadow and la'ilaha in the end. The staffiru ka wa natubu ilayk. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa al-Asr. Inna al-insana la fi khus. Inna al-lalina amanu. Wa amilu salihati. Wa tawasul al-haqi. Wa tawasul al-sab. Jazakumullah wa khairan. See you all next time. And we'll see you soon, inshallah. Again, Dr. Isra. Assalamu alaikum for our Zoom friends.